watershed because if the, the hillside is completely degraded when you have heavy rains and storms, the amount of landslide and flooding, and we worked out that from the cost to clear up the landslides, the cost to um, to people from destruction of homes by the flooding and to re replacement of a lot of things caused by damage from flooding. So we added that as well. And so we got a, a close, we didn't get a complete picture of what happened, but we got a figure that we could live with and that the politicians and these decision makers understood that there was a value and there was a cost. You, you, you must negotiation with the do we accept that you are calculation? Yes, the act is basically for the government to understand that they need to put more resource to reforest and revegetate and to protect that watershed area. So when this, they, when we put the figures to them to terms of the cost um, from the losses and degradation, they were receptive enough. We didn't give all the money we wanted, but they gave some more than they would have normally given. We didn't justify the argument. And this is the case with the Denver water example as well. That was really the impetus for the whole project was they had a history of um, severe fires. And so they, they knew what it cost already because they had that, that damage happen already in the past. So they said, hey, let's invest, let's, let's invest $16 million instead of waiting to pay another hundred million. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a wonderful So we have, I believe, yes, it is 3.30. We're perfectly on time. So then we have a little bit more. I'm just going to do not a whole lot on tools. On your flash drive is that one document with tons of websites. I'm just going to show you what a few look like. Um, and then what I really want to do is sort of pull chairs into a circle and have a discussion about what we can build from today. Um, that's really important to me. I, mean, I, I hope you are all learning something and this has been a, a good use of your time. But I would like to see where we can go from here. There are a number of directions that can take. We can decide do we want to build an online community of practice? Do we want to try to form some sort of web space where we can um, continue to dialogue, what, how can we work together to help each other achieve whatever our projects might be. And this could take a number of different forms. Also, um, after the coffee break, there are evaluation forms that I'll put on the tables. It's really important to the Conservation Campus staff to get those evaluations and you can just leave them with our, our very helpful volunteers at the back. So please don't forget to do that. So we have a 15 minute coffee break and then we'll take a really quick look at some tools have a chat about where we can go from here. And then after that, the last thing is for those of you who want to sort of step through the calculations, I have some, some sample volume data and you can do that. And also don't forget, I do have certificates. Um, so don't leave without that. And, but we have, we have plenty of time and I, I just want to make sure everyone's needs are met. Make sure you grab a card and if you have specific questions you want me to pass on, to Dr. E or to Pradeepa from Guyana, um, make sure that I get those before you leave as well. So if we could be back at quarter to four, that'd be really excellent. Thanks for hanging in there. Because you can explore all of this on your own, I just wanted to show you what some of these sites look like. And again, there's a lot of stuff on your flash drive. There's that one document with just a list of all kinds of links to websites that are, I think, um, really good sources of information on a whole lot of different topics related to carbon. So again, your handout this gives you all, all sorts of things. Not all methods or tools are going to be appropriate for your spatial scale or in your country. They may not meet your needs, but they can show you sort of the universe of what's possible, and it might provide a model then you might want to choose to adapt to meet your own needs and say, well, I like this approach, and I think this will work for us, and we're going to adapt it to meet our needs. So it's just a good starting point. It can let you know what's out there and maybe give you some inspiration. Um, so one of these, of course,
can't talk about this enough, the IPCC greenhouse gas site. Uh, one of the things on your flash drive is also the guidance. They have new guidance on forest degradation and accounting related to that. And I thought that might be of use, so that's included as well. And everything on the IPCC site can be downloaded free of charge in a variety of languages. So that is really helpful. They have broken everything out by chapter, so you can't download the whole volume at once, and so it is a little bit tedious, which is why I gave you volumes one and four, but of course I, I didn't download them in every language possible, but they are out there in a variety of languages. And this is just a quick look, so you'll know you've come to the right place, and I don't use pointers very often. But you can see over here, so here's the 2006 guidelines. Here's the good practice guidance on land use, land use change in forestry. That's on your drive as well. This degradation is a new one. The old guidelines are there that were revised. And you can see here's Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian, and Spanish. So just so you know you've gotten to the right place, this is a great resource, all kinds of stuff there. Uh, in the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency is the lead agency who handles the reporting guidance. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service is responsible for the forestry sector, and other agencies have their responsibilities as well. The EPA has the final, uh, final responsibility for that. We have a lot of tools available, and a lot of them, because we're very lucky to have an ongoing forest census program, rely heavily on that inventory data. In other nations, they take primarily a modeling approach because they don't have a legacy of that data, and some are hybrid of the two. So this is a quick look of um, one of my favorite websites, the Northern Research Station Forest Carbon Tools website, with uh, my friend Beauty Pan there on there. And so here is a good source. It has links to a lot of our software tools. Again, they may not be appropriate for you. They probably won't be. But it will give you an idea of how you might go about doing things. And there are also some different papers you can download as well. So that's one of my favorite websites. In Canada, the Canadian Forest Service has uh, the lead for the forest carbon part of the budget. They have a Monterey County and reporting system, and they are working on their national forest inventory system. They do kind of go by provinces a bit, so it's maybe not quite as uh, nationally consistent as in the U.S. And they also use this uh, carbon budget model. So they use a process model combined with inventory data to handle their reporting needs. And this is just a look at their uh, front page. They talk about land use change. Canada, of course, with a lot of bark beetle outbreaks and, and fire that disturbance plays a big role in their economic system. So that's just a quick look at what Canada's page looks like. So you might think, you know, questions to ask yourself is in your country, which agency or agencies is responsible for the greenhouse gas inventory overall and then the forest sector? And they may or may not, this is a difficulty that comes up, they may or may not also be responsible for monitoring land use change. So often that, that responsibility can be housed in different parts of the, of the government, and that can cause some, some problems. So certainly in the United States, we have several different ways of doing land area, and so we can come up with, with different numbers between the different inventory systems of how many acres we actually have or something. And this is a really common problem around the world is actually nailing down forest area. It doesn't seem like it should be a problem, but it actually is. Australia has a national carbon accounting system. Uh, there's a lot of background information as well as the carbon accounting toolbox. And again, they also rely heavily on a process model approach as a component. It's called full cam, and they use that to generate their greenhouse gas emissions, their estimates for the land use sector. And again, these may or may not work for you, but they all these are systems that have been up and running, all three of these, for quite a while. And it just gives you an idea of the way different countries have solved the problem. And this is currently what the front page of the National Carbon Accounting System looks like at this point in time. Okay, so that's really all of the formal stuff that I had. This is a gratuitous picture, actually, I took last year in the White Mountains of New Hampshire overlooking Huntington Ravine. So there are a few low trees. They're not very big there because this is an outland environment. So this is your turn. And what I would like to do now 
is sort of if we could maybe pull chairs into a circle um, and hopefully thinking about what we can build from here, what you would like to do in the future, how I might be able to help you, how we might be able to help each other. Do we want to develop some sort of web forum where we can work together? Um, we, do we want to write a synthesis paper about case studies or about challenges and opportunities in Forest Carpenter County in developed and developing nations? I don't know, those are just things I thought of. But if we could all kind of come into one space and just sort of, I'm going to take notes. I would really like to not have this end today. I'd really like to be able to build something and, and have a chance to continue to work together to, uh, to help each other out in our forest carbon endeavors. So if we can just maybe rearrange the furniture a bit. Um, let's see if we can, if we can build something.
yes, would be very interesting. Well, I have to mention in the presentation, there's a great website called Ecosystem Commons. Ecosystem Commons. I don't know if folks have seen it before, but it's an online um, community um, practice, kind of, I guess. It is. It's where a He's, he's also an expert in uh, 
the government's administration. I've worked with him. He's also an expert. Yeah, so we will get linked up on that. Actually, I mean, my PhD was partly in that. I did carbon, I mean, carbon, carbon flows in agroforestry systems. Thank you. Is that something we might, I mean, I, part of what I have here is there are some new, I mean, there's a, a journal called Carbon Balance and Management. There are some that are really specifically focused on carbon, and I'm wondering with people's different experience, if there might be a smaller group that wants to maybe lay out challenges and opportunities and, and maybe agroforestry. I mean, we don't have to necessarily offer, we can offer case studies or sort of things to think about or highlight needs, you know, that here's the possibility of, you know, people just care about the crop, but we can add in some of these other benefits and maybe kind of set up our framework to get people thinking about agroforestry and carbon. And if that's something people would like to do, like a smaller subgroup would like to work on some sort of synthesis paper that might get people talking in the larger, larger carbon community, that's certainly an outcome that I think we can have from today. 